This video follows up on two other videos on basic DC motors. One introducing uh, these different types of DC motors, in particular the permanent magnet DC motor that uh, we'll be looking at in this lab. A second video was on uh, modeling that motor uh, and identifying model parameters that we want to try to identify through some basic experiments. Purposely chose the low cost motor that I'm showing here on this slide. Uh, took one apart here. These are very cheap motors you can find online, about a dollar fifty a piece. So what we want to do is see if, given a motor like this where you don't have very much information on its performance, to see if we can extract uh, the key model parameters that can give us a description, for example, of the torque speed curve. This shows the this little permanent magnet DC motor disassembled. Um, here's here's the the rotor, the shaft, the commutator is shown here. There's only three segments on this particular commutator. And in another slide, I'll show you the three coils. You know, you can see the laminations um, on 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 the rotor here, and um, here are the permanent magnets, the north and south side, and um, the terminals can't be seen, but when you test these in the lab, you'll see there's two attachments here where you can connect to that, and those are attached to these two brushes. Uh, they're just spring-loaded, and they attach right here on the commutator. So what we want to do is determine, again, the, um, the ideal conversion relation that gives you torque, say, related to current, but we also want to measure the uh, friction that's inherent in the brushes as well as in these journal bearings that sit within the case there and um, there's going to be losses as the rotor rotates um, and of course the rotor has inertia which will be the final experiment we discuss another photo of the of the rotor showing the three windings so this this commutator has three segments and uh, so you can see the commutator uh, at any time would be attached um, on two of these here, say, and uh, each one of those would be have an attachment, say, to one of the windings. And so you'd be powering only one of these windings at a time. This is kind of a rough motor. Uh, finer motor will have more coils, more commutator segments, so you get a smoother torque. Um, and this just shows another um, photo of that same rotor. So the measurements that we want to take uh, in order to find the key parameters, uh, uh, first you want to design an experiment to measure the uh, terminal resistance um, of the motor. Uh, this electrical resistance uh, again is formed by the, coil, the total coil resistance um, and um, also there's going to be some uh, brush contact resistance, you know, where the brush is are touching against the commutator, there's always some contact resistance there. Um, primary resistance will be, of course, in the coil, but this contact resistance, you know, as this gets worn and dirty, it can it can affect that. And of course, it makes the signals kind of noisy as well. But anyway, the primary resistance is from the coil. And uh, remember, that's the R sub M. Now, you might be tempted to just put an ohmmeter across that, and you can try that. A lot of times ohmmeters don't inject enough current in the circuit like this to give you a good measurement. So uh, you have to think about um, another way of, of, of picking up the uh, resistance uh, and we'll, the TAs will talk about that in the lab. Um, but a better way is just to actually do a locked rotor test and um, measure the voltage drop across the whole motor circuit and um, measure the induced current and then find resistance that way. Um, you also run some steady state experiments and in those steady state experiments you can measure say the input voltage into the motor, the steady state shaft speed and the motor current. Right? I'm, show, I'm showing a table here. Uh, it's useful to you know for each different test representing an adjustment of the input voltage, you know, record the three different values. These are all useful. I'm indicating here 
how we can measure current using a sensing resistor. So what we typically do in that kind of configuration, if you can imagine, you might have, here's the coil, res the coil resistance, the motor, and what we typically would do is on the other terminal, we would attach a little sensing resistor here. And actually, that goes to ground. And then uh, we know this value. We don't know this value, right? So here's your input voltage. So what we want to do is measure the voltage here. Call that V sub S from here to ground. So here are the, here's the VN. You measure this voltage. Again, of course, this is either rotating or not. And then you measure this voltage across this resistor. So uh, this would give you right the, the current through the motor I sub M as the voltage drop that you can measure from here to ground divided by the known sensing resistor. And a lot of times you got to choose an R, uh, a, a low resistance here, but also one that's a high a power resistor. So um, in case it gets a little hot, right? Um, and then uh, usually we can measure speed here with a tachometer. If your motor has an encoder, that's another way that you could estimate the angular velocity. Imagine if you locked the rotor. So if you lock the rotor, that means you know you, you, you would just hold the shaft and make omega equal, equal to zero. Remember what happens since the back EMF on that motor is going to be Rm times omega. If you make this go to zero, then the back EMF is zero, which means the voltage basically across this element is zero. So if you measured Vn, Vs, Vs would give you the current. That would give you, you can show a way of finding R sub m. And I found that that's a better way of determining the uh, motor contact resistance. These three measurements by running steady state experiments, remember what you do is you adjust the input voltage and uh, just such that you cover a, a range of speeds. Uh, you then make collect these three different values. This is going to allow you to determine the two other parameters that we want, which is the R sub M and um, a model for the resistance. For example, if it was linear, it would allow you to find the, um, the B sub M value. So here's how you could use that data. See, you're measuring, this shows first, the first graph shows a plot for different speeds, right? And if you can now determine V sub M, and remember V sub M is simply the input voltage minus, right? Um, and here's the resistance times the current that you're measuring. So this current is what you measure from the sensing resistor. This here is has to be the total resistance, right? So it's the sum, right? If you have a sensing resistor in there, you have to include that in there. And that'll give you V sub M, which is the back EMF. In this case, it's not a locked rotor test. This is a, you know, the motor is actually rotating, right? You're measuring omega sub M and you're plotting those values here. And then you're calculating V sub M and that's basically the, the this voltage, but you can't measure directly, right? Um, and when you plot Vm versus omega m, you see you can get a correlation then so that you can get a good value of, of R sub m, which is your motor constant. You can expect this to be a linear relationship. With that same set of data from that table, you can now... Um, Remember, if you're running this motor, there's a little, remember we drew that little bond graph. And the only thing we have in here is some resistance. Um, you have an input voltage, which is the source here. You have the input resistance. This is the electrical resistance. Over here is the, is the loss. So the, the total motor torque here, the only torque that it's going to see is whatever losses you have. Um, in this lab, we may actually add a little propeller on that motor, for example. So all these losses here would include all the friction, possibly this motor propeller losses, right? Which you might expect might go as omega squared, like a quadratic. So you, know, you, you might see that if you now take 
right? So now if you can plot T sub M, because the T sub M is gonna be equal to the total loss torque on here, right? Um, so the output torque, that's what I'm saying here, is, is equal to Tm, but since you have found Rm and you have omega m, just plot on this, on the, on the, um, on the, on, on the uh, ordinate here, uh, the y-axis if you like, Rm times omega m, right? Because you know both of these values. Uh, and so you, that gives you, right, the y-coordinate. You plot that against the speed. And then this will show you what the loss, effective loss, looks like. If if all you have is is a is linear loss, you know you should you you, you know you'll see a nice you know linear relationship here. And these are this is again the losses. If you have a significant effect, say from the quadratic losses in the propeller, you might see this trend up. So it all depends on how far out you go in the omega here. You have to be careful with some of these small motors, as as we'll um, discuss in the lab. Uh, and not to run it at too high a voltage. These little motors uh, don't like to go much higher than about three volts. Uh, they start getting really hot. So after you run, get both of these correlations characterized, the friction, you will have everything you need. You will have found R sub M, little R sub M, and the losses, right? Whatever, you know, loss torque you have. And that could be linear, which means you'll have a BM, or you'll have um, some correlation of loss torque uh, as a function of omega. And then you can put that into your steady state model for your motor. The last step then is finding the rotor inertia, which requires that we run a dynamic experiment, right? So we run the motor at steady state speed um, uh, and uh, run steady state experiments. Now what we can do is run um, either, you know, two different tests. We can, you can do a, a transient test where the motor um, is uh, over time, you know, at some time you turn it on and this guy would, uh, you know, kick up and depending on what kind of dynamics it has, we're seeing that their only energy storage here is the moment, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the rotor inertia. So this look, should look like a first order system. And from this response, we could possibly f figure out a tau, and then um, we could get, uh, if it was linear, or we could run a simulation and compare to, to our simulation response and start trying to tune the J sub M to make it fit here, and this would be speed. Um, so we have to be able to measure omega, right? So th this is the harder experiment to run. Um, a better experiment turns out to run the motor up to steady state speed and then remove the voltage. In other words, you know, imagine now you've got this motor here, right? And remember, you still have your sensing resistor here, so you can measure current. Um, this guy could have a little propeller. It's running at some omega steady state, and you've been putting a, an input voltage here. It's got some R sub M. You know this guy. You know this you know the losses. The only thing you don't know is what is J sub M. So run this guy with an applied voltage, get it up to steady state speed, and then make this zero, open that up. So now what happens to the current, right? Current goes to zero, but this guy keeps spinning, right? The neat thing is, is if you keep monitoring, you know, you've your applied voltage is, is zero, but you can still measure the voltage at this point. And it should basically reflect, right, what is the voltage V sub M that's being generated now. So now the motor, you think, is still spinning down. You, you, you still have a voltage across this motor. So if you can measure that V sub M, then, um, right, V sub M is related to R times omega sub M. So by measuring V sub M, you know R sub M you can measure omega, right? So what you'll, what you would see is, is the omega coming along at steady state speed and then boom, you let it go and it's going to just spin down. And, and by comparing a simulation or a model to data that you collect uh, uh, during the spin down, you can try to estimate J sub M, right? So a model for this, for this experiment, dynamic model is simply, 
the right the, the rate of change of momentum which is j sub m omega dot and then sub m and that's whatever the torques are in here which is going to be only the you know the total loss torques right that, that are left over i'm showing this as t0 but and so whatever model you have for the loss torques that you've already found you put that in there and then the only thing that you have left is the j sub m and you can again compare that to your simulation and iteratively solve for j sub m if you have a linear friction model then the, this whole thing will compare nicely to sort of a classic standard first order linear system and all you'd have to do then is um, whenever this thing decays down this looks like a decaying exponential right it goes as, as e to the minus t over tau so if you could just estimate a you know from the time you let it go to you know whatever your tau is the tau should be equal to j over b if you knew b you measure tau you could estimate j right so it's a classic way for a linear first order system to find j you have to first show that you have a linear model before you could do something like this so in the end you have two ways that you can find inertia if the motor losses are found to be mostly linear then you can take that linear uh, damping constant constant and helps you estimate the rotor inertia using a time constant uh, if you find that the loss relations uh, are not linear uh, because of the uh, square losses, uh, square speeds, the losses that go with the square of the speed, for example, then just use a simple simulation of the nonlinear system and iteratively um, adjust your J sub M, comparing with measured transient shaft speed data from a spin down test uh, to kind of narrow in on a, on a good value for the uh, rotor inertia.